cope with this if it was every other month. Once a fortnight, even. But every day? Yes, he certainly likes his banquets, King Shafriar. I mean, take his father. One banquet a month and the extras for eclipses. Nothing wrong with that. Perfectly acceptable. You can forgive extras for eclipses. Extras for eclipses I can tolerate. But this, this is want and excess. Want and excess, as you say. And how long has this been going on now? A month? Longer? And would you say this has made him popular? No, not popular. And no. why not? Does it have something to do with his wanton excess? It does have something to do with that, yes. It is also not unrelated to his freedom with the executioner's scimitar. Oh, the scimitar. I mean, I lost count of the wives he's had executed. 38. What? 38. How do you know that? It's in the paper. Look, 39th queen to be executed at dawn, wedding at noon, banquet at 6.30. Weather continues fine. Let me see that. <laughs> Queen Faraja, latest wife of His Excellency, King Shakriar, will be beheaded at dawn this morning for the usual reason. The usual reason? Yes, you know. Well, humor me. Fill me in for the benefit of the public at large. Oh, I see. This is a dramatic device, isn't it? Right. Well, it all started when the king married what turned out to be his first wife. The new couple enjoyed 12 months of connubial bliss. Then one day, he comes home to find his lovely wife in the embraces of another man. He had his wife and her lover executed on the spot, and that really should have been the end of it. But it wasn't even the beginning of the end, was it? No, nor the end of the beginning. More the <laughs> beginning of the end of Do you the... want me to go on? Now, possessed with the insane belief that every woman must be a deceiver. The serpent beneath the flower. Very good. And that he could never, ever find another wife he could trust. He hit upon the crazed notion to marry a different virgin each morning before she could deceive him with another man. Get it? Got it. Good. Here we, Here we go. go. My daughters, Shahrazad, Dinozad, and Jamila. I rejoice at your return. We wish you many years of bountiful harvest. May those who serve you never be false, and may your children prove loving and dutiful. <laughs> so how is my brother, gloomy and snobbish as ever? He doesn't much like his new job. Well, he's tax collecting a little beneath him, I think. <laughs> if they made him the king of the nine kingdoms, he'd find it beneath him. <laughs> and how do my daughters? Uh, you have heard, of course. Is there nothing anyone can do to- No! Nothing! And the executions? Every morning, yes. In fact, there's another young woman going to her death as we speak. Who organizes them? I do. Oh, father! As Grand Vizier, it is my responsibility, part of my great office. How do you bear it? I must put on the harness of necessity. I tell myself that in my charge, these poor young women have a more merciful ending than might otherwise be the case. I make sure the executioner has sharpened his scimitar. Father, you have not raised us like other young women. I saw no point in having uneducated young offspring to tend for me in my old age. You can sing to me, weave me tapestries. So we three have talked, and we have a way forward. It is my intention, with your blessing, she wants to offer herself as his next wife. Offer yourself to the king? To certain death? Father, we've been back only a few hours, but already it's clear what's happening here. This is now a plague town. A city at war with itself. Women who can are fleeing. And those who cannot live in terror. Waiting for the day when they will be chosen. It, it has, has to, to end. end. And you, our father. Even after only a few weeks away, you look older. A broken man. How long can you keep <laughs> doing this? But why you, Shahrazad? I have an idea. If it succeeds... And if it fails... If it fails, I shall at least have cut off so many days of fearing death! For he will come for us in the end. You know that, Father. No, no, he would not come for you. He would not touch you. He would not kill my daughters. He would live. Go to my brother. And every day receive news of how many more of our friends, our cousins, have died? No, I have chosen. But I have to have your blessing. She's got some guts, that one. What's she gonna do? Kill him, I bet. Plunge a concealed weapon into his unprepared and defenseless torso. Ha! 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 
Have you been reading those thrillers again? They're only stories, Maru. What are they? Only stories, babe. Here we go again. Why do you offer yourself like this, Shahadazad? You must know the esteem in which I hold your father, and you whom I have known since we were children. I would never have chosen you. It is my destiny, great one. A strange destiny to offer yourself to me in the certain knowledge that you will die. Do you know what it is like to perish by the executioner's scimitar, Shahadazad? You kneel, your hands tied behind your back, your beautiful hair brushed from the nape of your neck, and you wait. Your one hope is that the executioner's scimitar will be sharp. That, from many cuts, is so undignified. You cannot make me any more terrified than I already am. You are determined, then. I am. I ask one favor, that my sisters Dinarzad and Jamila be allowed to join me an hour before dawn. I should like to take a proper farewell. It is unusual, but I would not wish to deny the daughter of the Grand Vizier. Thank you, Great One. Then I shall order a wedding banquet. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Surrounded by a thousand tribesmen, chained to a precipice, an avalanche of rocks thundering down the mountainside above him, a swarm of killer wasps buzzing around his head? <laughs> How did he escape? Why, isn't it obvious? Not to me, it isn't. Great one, we disturbed you. Never mind that. First, tell me how he escaped. No, first, who was he? No, where did he come from? Wait, did you say killer wasp? <laughs> Confound it! <laughs> All right, all right, silence that dreadful bell. I spare your life until tomorrow, but only on condition that you tell me the story. Which story, great one? Uh, the one about the tribesmen and the avalanche. No, the precipice and the, oh, I, the, the killer wasp. I don't know. If your excellency will sit, I will begin a tale of gold, cunning, and avarice. It is called The Tale of Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves. I think I've heard it. <laughs> oh, but not the way I shall tell it, oh husband. Your husband? Where? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I suppose I had forgotten. There were once, oh husband, two brothers of Persia. Their names were Qasim and Ali Baba. Neither was rich, but the older brother, Qasim, married a wealthy heiress, while the younger, Ali Baba, found a wife as poor as himself. But one day, when Ali Baba was in the woods collecting firewood to sell at the market, he made a discovery that was to change his life. A dust cloud? Must be a merchant caravan. Or the king's cavalry. Well, it's not the cavalry, that's certain. And I'm not sure I like the look of, perhaps discretion would be the better part of valor. To attention, my forty thieves! Come, 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 yes, come. Come. My splendid men, to the cave! To the, to the, the cave! Over here, my sturdy fellows! Over here! Over here! Open sesame! Oh my goodness, bandits, and a cave, and a magic door. Open Sesame! Shut, Sesame. Our earnings will be safe until our return, my bold companions in arms. Do we get this sherbet now? As much as you can drink, my light-fingered little chappies, for you are the forty thieves! Boom! Boom! Yes, stop! I really think I should just go back to my comfortable, boring life and forget all about this. What? 
On the other hand, they must be far off by now. Then again, if they came back while I was still inside, I would have never heard them. Looked at another way. Now listen here, Woodseller. There's a small fortune, well, quite a large one actually, of gold and jewels sat in that cave. Enough to make you and your wife rich beyond your wildest dreams. Now are you going in Great there? Great one, it's a story! Pop, pop. What? He is a character. Well, I know that, but... You cannot change it. What will be, will be. I am King Shafiar. I can do what I like. To me, to him, to a hundred wives, yes. But you cannot change the story. <laughs> on that, on the other hand, open sesame. Best not be greedy. Anyway, there's only so much my old donkey we will be able to carry. Ah, this will be handy. I am the genie of the, of the skillet. What is your <laughs> command, oh master? Uh, I think you're in the wrong story. What? <laughs> there isn't a genie in Alibaba. Are you sure? Mm-hmm. Add one. <laughs> no. Wait! Are you sure you're a real genie? Yes. Why? Well, I'd somehow picture genies as taller. <laughs> I'm a teeny genie. <laughs> Shut, Sesame. Now this is where it'd be really handy to have a theatrical convention to get me home. And what time do you call this? Don't put in the wife in that tone of voice. I know you want to leave about. What is it this time? You stopped for just one drink with Bussam the poet? No. You were chatting about the oldest with Harim the unit. No, what? I bet it was a new bar man. <laughs> oh my god! He's killed somebody! I knew he was going to My mother won't you are not bullied about a complete waste of time. Hush, wife, and I'll tell you how it came by it. So Ali Baba told his wife about the cloud of dust, the robber captain, the magic doors, and the, the 40 thieves. Did you hear something? Probably just the neighbors. Now I want to deposit this gold into different banks all over the city. So first we have to see how much it weighs. My sister-in-law. What about her? She just bought new fields for that gorgeous custom kitchen of his. She won't be able to boast about that two chariots and indoor sanitation anymore. You do not breathe a word about Mr. Hoare or my brother, do you understand? All right, I'm not stupid. Kasi might keep it to himself, but Fitna would blab it all over the city and we find ourselves murdered in our beds. I'll just say we need them to waste some flour. Good, she'll fall for that. We need them to waste some flour. Don't you even own skills? Oh, you poor thing. I'll just give them a wipe around. They're straight from the market. Latest design from Malik the metalsmith. Probably still a bit dusty. But Fitna had other ideas. There was something in Dunya's nervous manner that made her suspicious. Why did she really need those scales? So she took some lard and smeared it round the bottom of the pan. That way, when she got the scales back, she'd be able to see what had stuck to them. Here you are, Dunya. A good luck with the flower. Mwah, mwah. <laughs> But what do you mean, behaving oddly? Coming here to borrow my scales? She'd rather be beaten over the head with a wet helmet. No, she's up to something. Probably that feckless brother of mine. Don't you worry, Fitna. I'll soon worm it out of her. You won't need to, husband. I had a cunning plan. Dunya, and how's my dear brother? Very well, thank you, Carson. Much obliged for the loan of the scales, Fitna. Can't stay, must go. And how's the wood selling trade? Plenty of Wood to sell? Fool me! You wouldn't believe how well we are doing. A quite unprecedented uptick in the combustible market. Who would have thought? Oh, <laughs> well, best not keep you, Dunya. Now, let's see what they've been up to. 
Gold. gold. It was an easy matter for the greedy pair to bully the truth out of Dunya and Ali Baba, but they swore upon everything they held most sacred, never to reveal the location of the cave, nor, of course, to visit it themselves. I have, of course, to visit it myself. Won't it be dangerous, husband? Naturally. But what will that fool of a brother do with such a fortune? We can bring it back here, and when he next visits the cave, he'll just think the robbers came to remove it. Be careful, Posse. For a man of my caliber, this will be child's play. Open sesame! Shut sesame! Oh, perfect. Per that will look, brother. Now, one at a time. Best not be greedy. Well, they wouldn't miss. Now just say the magic words. You know those moments when you can't remember your neighbor's name? Or where you left your keys and why the camel is wearing your glasses? Well, try as you might, Cossin simply could not bring to mind the magic words to open those doors. <laughs> and he tried everything. Open Lindsay, open Tarragon, open organic Dara Masala? Try <laughs> open Sesame. Sesame, Sesame, of course, silly of me to forget. Open an intruder! Deal with him, my scruffy assassin! No! Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> ah! Right. A little excessive, my merry if over-enthusiastic men. What do we do with the men? Bury them! Yes! Bury them! Feed them to the vultures! Yes! yes! Feed them to the vultures! Sell them to the Yes! Taxidermist! Yes, 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 yes. Or Haram, the pie lady! Or Haram! <laughs> no. Rather than dispose of them, we will fix them to the walls inside the cave as a warning to anyone else who dares violate our secret lair. Yes! yes. Nail them up! Nail them up! Nail them up! Nail them up. Three days! Do not he's been gone for three days! It's his own fault! I told him not to go near that cave, but would he listen? He's probably had a small accident, but not as brain I come No, when something terrible has happened, sister-in-law, I can feel it in my bones. I'll leave him back soon, and I am sure he'll be bringing Cassie with him. And all will be well, mistress. You can trust master's brother. Remember the time we're all stuck out in the camel down in Bajra? Remember those days? Oh, he's dead, isn't he? I'm sorry, Finna. The <laughs> robbers must have surprised him. He had a mercifully quick end. I must see him! No! No, sister! Let Morjana clean his body and lay him out as fitting. <laughs> Morjana, I have always known you as a loyal and faithful servant. Now what I'm about to tell you must remain an inviolable secret between us. You can trust me, master. Kasim's body. Yes? It's... Resting in peace? More pieces, really. <laughs> the bits are in the bags, slung over the donkeys. For reasons I'll explain later, it is of the utmost importance that my brother have a perfectly ordinary funeral. We will give it out that he's died of a sudden illness and that nothing happens to raise the slightest comment in town. Now- I understand. He <coughs> went to the secret cave you swore him never to visit, was surprised by the robbers who had presumably stashed the treasure there, and was cut up into several segments. Well, yes, but how did you- Mistress cannot keep a secret either. And if you take my advice, she must never know the truth of her husband's fate. Leave it to me. Good morning, Morjana. Good morning. Good morning, Morjana. Good morning, Lindsay, the apothecary. And how does my friend, the esteemed Kasim? Not so well as he might be, Lindsay. In fact, I fear a reoccurrence of his old trouble. His old? An illness he picked up many years back in Aleppo. Mistress sorely fears that one day it will Carry him off. May fate forbid it. I have just the thing, Mozan. Two lozenges three times a day after meals. No alcohol. Thank you, Mumbir. I cannot tell you how reassured we all feel. Oh, and one thing. It might affect Kasim's business if news of his affliction were to get about. Of course. The confidentiality of the surgery, Morjana. You can trust me. Oh, I do. <laughs> Why, you'll never guess who's caught this illness. Caught the lepo, apparently. But this was just the first stage of Murjana.
Nana's plan. Every morning over the next few days, she would visit Mundir the apothecary, and each time, poor Kasim's illness would have worsened. And each time, Mundir would give her some even stronger and more expensive lozenges with the solemn promise that his patient's deterioration will remain a matter of the strictest confidence. May I but stricken dead if a <laughs> dying can't possibly last the dead. Kasim's funeral took place the following morning, and there was great lamentation for the good man's passing. Excellent. However, it is As time. I at the end of the story, Great One, had it not been for, for, for. Of course, for, the forty thieves. Oh, yes, <laughs> what was that? Probably the camel. Mm, well, carry on. As you say, wise one, had it not been for revenge, 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 my shabbily attired wronged ones. But who do we cut up this time, Chief? Whom, Hamid? Home. We may be savage, merciless bandits who dissect our enemies and nail their severed remains to cave walls, but there is no excuse for lapses in grammar. <laughs> so, whom do we? Plainly, our thief had an accomplice. Your mission, Hamid, is to go into town and make enquiries. Right, Chief. What about? I beg your pardon. About what, Chief? About any mysterious deaths in the past week, any hasty funerals. Even in five pieces, our first intruder had to be buried somewhere. Will I meet you back here, Chief? No, we will reconnoiter in our mountain lair. Mm, less eyewitnesses. No, Hamid, fewer. So, so it's fewer for a number, less for one. So Hamid journeyed into town and arrived at dawn, coincidentally the time when Baba Mustafa was in the habit of opening his shop. Morning. Morning. Must be tiring work. Mm -hmm. But I bet nothing gets past you, eh? I bet your eyes are pretty sharp. Sharp? I'll say they're sharp. Did you know I sewed a body together the other day by lamplight? A body? Mm hmm. In five pieces it was. Of course, I was sworn to secrecy. I bet you were, but uh, I'd wait till you could remember where you, where you did it. They blindfolded me. Mind you, if encouraged, I bet I could leave you there. Right, now blindfold me like the last time and I'll take you to the door. Brilliant. Yes, we cobblers have our moments. Of course, I'm not accustomed to so 
showing bodies. Normally I'm a mender of souls. I assume you would like to return alive. <laughs> Understood. Good. The cobbler was no fool, and it was not long before he had led Hamid back to the very door where Murshana had taken him only a few days before. This is it. You sure? Of course I'm sure. Not this one? Or this? Right. That'll do. Are we nearly there yet? Shut up. I don't like this. By nightfall, all was quiet in the street where stood the dead Kasim's house, in which now lived Kasim's widow Fitna, Ali Baba, his wife Dunya, and his son Kadi. Wait a minute, you didn't mention a son before. He hasn't been important before. Hmm. And his son, Karim, not forgetting Murjana, the ever-resourceful servant, for only she knew in what danger they all now stood. Just along here, Chief. The door is marked with us. Cross, Hamid. Angry with Hamid for bungling the operation, Abu Zar sent a second henchman the following day to question Baba Mustafa and place a cross on the right door. And as before, Murjana foiled their plans by talking crosses on all the doors in the street. This, this went on for 38 days, days, until Abu Zar, tired of his underlings' incompetence, took on the mission himself. <coughs> of course, I'm not accustomed to sewing body. Normally, I'm a vendor. Oh, oh. This time, Abu Zar did not trust chalk marks but stood in front of the door for almost an hour, noting every scratch and dent, every dirt mark, every unsightly malformation. Do you mind? <coughs> Until he was certain that he would remember it again. <coughs> Until dawn. So Abu Zad waited until dawn when he knew the owner of the house would appear. And when he did, the cunning robber captain told Ali Baba that he was an oil merchant in need of lodgings for the night and a safe place to store his merchandise. Forty jars of oil, to which the generous, hospitable, and unsuspecting Ali Baba responded by offering the oil merchant a night's lodging in his own home and the use of his courtyard for the jars of oil. He's a merchant, Morjana, an oil merchant, on his way to the coast. Couldn't he have stayed in an inn? He could, I suppose, but we can afford to accommodate him, and I'd like you to treat him as our guest. Light all the lamps. We'll have dancing. I'll slay a goat. Lovely. Light all the lamps. Well, if he's an oil merchant, he's not going to miss any oil. <laughs> Is it time? Is it time? No, not yet. <laughs> My father will fear for Jada. We ought to tell him. Your father will be dead if we don't act now, Karim. Oh, all right. Do the other servants know what to do? The oil is boiling. They know what to do.
recognize him. He's a merchant. He seeks refuge in my home. I'm his host. Did you not tell me of the robber captain, the one who opened and closed the cave doors with the magic words? I warrant if you look at this man closely, you will find the same man, master. The robber captain, you mean? Yes, master. They are all dead now, but he was the leader of... The, the Forty Thieves! Did you hear something? Just the offstage chorus, Master. So, the trusty and courageous Morjana saved her master's life, for which Ali Baba was so grateful that he gave her his son in marriage. For there is no gift for a man so great as the companionship of a courageous, witty, and virtuous woman. Indeed, especially when they are told so vividly that I seem to see the room peopled with characters. In fact, I swear that I could still smell the boiling oil and hear the death cries of the forty thieves. Um, well, let us to dinner and then bed, though I suspect you will have another story for me when dawn arrives, won't you? As your excellency wishes. It had better be good. I'm exhausted watching this stuff. The suspense is killing me. It's like one of those comic papyruses. Will Shaharazad keep King Shariar interested long enough that he forgets he's supposed to be executing her? Don't worry about it. It's none of our business. Like. <sighs> Sound cue. <laughs> like you. I don't know what it is, but I'm not getting a refreshing night. Day two in the king's palace. Salman told you have a story for us, Mari. Oh, yes. Oh, no. It's called Abu Hassan and the Historic Fart. Oh, what? <laughs> you can't say that. Say what? Fart. You can't say it. You did? Why not? You just can't. But it's the title, the traditional, original, ancient title. Going right back to, oh, all right. <laughs> Abu Hassan and the Historic Gust of Wind. A Bill Hassan and the historic gust of wind. Right, so there was this man called Abu Hassan. Have you heard it? Carry on, Mari. Abu Hassan, he lived in the town of Kakabon and was a celeb merchant. Totally rolling in. With all the bling and living large. A celeb merchant totally rolling in it. Bling, posse. This is not the language of storytelling, Ruth. You gotta dress it up a bit. Make it sound like the diction of our distant forebears. He was a merchant of fabled wealth and spotless reputation. He was a merchant of fabled wealth and spotless reputation. That's better. But oh, ye cruel fates, for lo, in the midst of his wedding ring. His nuptials. In the midst of his nuptials, at the zenith of his happiness, the pinnacle of his joy, the very summer solstice. Of That's enough. But what should happen but? <laughs> Yeah. 
Moscow, my comrades expelled their corrupt and incompetent leadership and reformed as a workers' cooperative. Yeah! And submitting to the economic forces of many capitalist induced global recession have voted to diversify into the field of marine acquisitions and redistributions. Marine acquisitions and redistributions. Thank you, brothers. Consistent, moreover, with our committee drafted mission statement, we are now freebooters are us! Also doing business as the 40 Pirates, still rounding up. Thank you, my artistically array comrade. And now, back to the cave! Ship! 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 Ship. Ship. <laughs> Abbas! <laughs> and Belay! Boo! Boo! Yes, it's up! Arr! You! How's that? Both one.
Tin or have the king and Shahrazad gone to bed a bit early this evening? Amazing! All this time and it's still working. <laughs> what is? Her plan to keep telling him stories one after oh, another so he yes. doesn't. Right. And how many has she told so far? It's hard to say. Work it out. I mean, they were married last winter. So much. It's a lot, Maru. And what if she runs out? I mean, how many stories are there in the world? She's got to run out sooner or later, and what she does. We could use my one. Your one what? My story. Abu Hassan and the historian. Hardly appropriate, Maru. Well, I can hold it in readiness for when she appears to be tired. You do that. In the meantime, let's make the most of our time off. What time off? Think about it. This is the first early day we had in months. That's right. So let's get in our seven hours before he changes his mind. <sighs> What now? I was just thinking about my story, you know the one. Good night, Maru. Good night, Zaid. <coughs> Man, that was never seven hours. No, unless I'm mistaken, that was another dramatic convention. <laughs> Is that breakfast? <coughs> but Excellency, surely you want to hear what became of the king's jester. I have lost my appetite for jesters. But this was the funniest man in the kingdom. Funniest? By a desert mile, Excellency. You will just bust yourself. <laughs> it had better be good. The tale of the king's jester. There was once the king's yes, jester. Yes, 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 yes. Got through the chase. <laughs> <laughs>
give up on. I think he came from the bedroom, sir. A house breaker, I'll warrant. Let me at him, Jeebex. Aha, so you think you can rob me, do you? Well, let me tell you, I have a short way with these. Get up, you scoundrel, and take your beating like a man. Ahem, sir. Uh, what is it, Jeebex? I think he's dead, sir. <laughs> what? Deceased, sir. Shuffled off this mortal coil. <laughs> By Jove, you're right. This is dashed awkward. Shall I call the watch? Yes. Uh, no, Jeebez, if this gets out, I could be voted off the Camel Club Committee. <laughs> if I may suggest, sir, I believe I have a device to make all well. <laughs> I am the genie of the incriminating blunt instrument. <laughs> Tail again. again. Oh, of course it is. <laughs> You were saying? Dawn is soon approaching, sir. I suggest we simply deposit the body in the marketplace. When the market traders arrive to open the stalls, they'll find the body and assume it has been set upon by night thieves and killed for his purse. Oh, thank you, Jeebus. You have saved the day yet again. I do my best to give satisfaction, sir. So the poor jester continued his nighttime wanderings, this time adorning a lamppost in the marketplace. It was not the market traders who were to find the body, for fate had her baby, yet another person's life was to be twined with that of the now lifeless Jester. I got it, I got it! Great pocket! Thief! Summon the watchman! Ah, here's one! I've got you, you what? scoundrel! What? You think what? you can take what? my wall what? without me now, noticing? Now. Nah, what? not today! Hold I've on got there, you! Sir. Let go! Oh dear, oh dear. Can you explain why you are choking this man, sir? <coughs> what man? This dead man, sir. Dead? I must ask you to accompany us to the king, sir. You are under arrest. Under arrest? Drunk by that sober man was quickly found guilty and sentenced to be beheaded the following day. A beheading was always regarded as a chief source of entertainment and attracted a huge crowd. And they were not to be disappointed, for events took a most unusual turn. <clears throat> hey. This execution is brought to you courtesy of Faisal's Falafels, the falafel you can trust. <laughs> Sorry, who are you? We are Admin, Admin. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> the 40 Advertisers Incorporated. No job, too small. <laughs> <laughs> Not now! For flavorful falafels, Faisal's never fails. Ooh, wait, haven't I seen no, you? No, who even no, are you? In the name of our most esteemed and reverend king, Amala Gadahi Rukan Adi Bebars Abu Dakdari, the third, if any of you here present know of any just cause or impediment why the head of Dar bin Hassan, citizen of Basra, should not be struck from his shoulders for the murder of the king's jester, Bulbul, speak now or forever hold your peace. Executioner, in the name of the king, do your duty. to be about their business. The merchant was found guilty and the execution ceremony started over again. <clears throat> hear ye, hear ye. In the name of the most esteemed and reverend king, Omalik al-Dahir Rukan al-Din Bebaz al Dari, the third, if any of ye here present yes. knows... <gasps> Not another one! I did it. The merchant is quite innocent. I opened my door rather suddenly and he fell and cracked his skull on the stone floor. So I and my housekeeper dropped him down the merchant's chimney. Right. Let's try this again. <laughs> hear ye, hear ye, in the name of our most esteemed and reverend king, Amalek al Wait! I don't believe this! We, we are, are to blame! blame. He choked on a fishbone in our house! And we propped him up outside the doctor! Look, I've got things to do. Anybody else who kills him, line up over there and write your names down. <laughs> in that case, Hear ye, hear ye, in the Wait. name of young people! In the name of Moses. Oh no, that's my line. Just get on with it. Message from the king. He wants everyone involved in the death of justice in court tomorrow morning, seven sharp. So we dumped him on the doctor, sire, and we dropped.
tracked him down the merchant's chimney, great one. Where I gave him a sound beating and my man hung him from the lamppost, if it please your wonderfulness. And I um, still haven't got the remotest idea what happened. <gasps> he wasn't dead at all. I have had the most ridiculous dream. Anybody want to hear the one about the ugly camel? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Ah, wonderful, wonderful. Has anyone ever heard a better story than that? I, your highness. Who are you? Shahadazad, esteemed King Afridun, wife of King Shafriar. Ah, yes, I've heard of him. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm getting very confused here. You're telling me that you're a character in the story now? We are all characters in all stories, husband. You're losing me. All these stories, they're part of us, and they change each time one of us tells them. No, didn't get that. If next week you yourself were to recount the story of the king's jester, he might instead be King Shafriar's jester. And instead of the exalted King Afridun, you yourself would be pronouncing the verdict. Possibly. As it is, I am telling the story, so I have placed myself in it. But it's just that Couldn't I would you... possibly sort this out later. <laughs> Forgive me, fellow King Afridun. <coughs> now, you are about to tell me. Shahrazad, of a better story than the one we just heard. <laughs> Proceed. I would be pleased to, Highness, but as you can see, the moon is up and it is bedtime. Tomorrow, if it please you, you will have your story. of the king's jester. Not today! Thank you! Well, carry on. Do you dream, husband? Dream? Of course I dream. Everybody dreams. Well, what do you take dreams to be? What's this about, Shahrazad? I thought you were telling me a story. Well, all right. We are taught that dreams are sent to us. For what purpose? For, for many different purposes. Stop asking me questions and go on with your story. Night. And these were broad. 
Officers always going, so tell me again. Don't they ever listen? Don't they ever write anything down? You really don't know much about the conventions of crime fiction, do you? <sighs> so tell me again. What were you doing in a mosque in the middle of the night? I told you I had a dream. A dream? Yes, in which a figure appeared to me and said, Go to Cairo. So you came to Cairo? Just like that? Because of a dream? <laughs> oh, that's so implausible, it just might be true. Look, listen, uh, I'll even Hashim. Right, right, left. Dreams right, are just left, dreams, right, they don't mean anything. Right. I can see that now. I mean, I have this dream right. all the time. Would you like to hear it? No, thanks. So I'm walking down the street, <laughs> straight street in Baghdad it is, and I come across this merchant's house. So I open the gate and go inside, and there's a marble fountain, beautiful, shaded under an olive tree. And there's this voice, and it says, Didon was here. That's me. <laughs> Didon was here. Dig under the olive tree, and you will find what you will find. And what did you find? No idea. That's where I wake up. I've always had this theory that dreams meant for someone else. You know, dream people got their wires crossed. Anyway, Ali bin Hashim, sorry about the beating. Easily done. Happens all the time. Fault on both sides, no doubt. Here's 10 dinars to get you the first available camel train back to Baghdad. But no more of this dreaming malarkey, eh? So, Ali bin Hashim went directly to Straight Street in Baghdad and entered his courtyard with the bubbling fountain, took a shovel, and dug under his olive tree. <laughs> I am rich again! Yes! No, it's mine! But remembering the vision and ashamed of his grasping bitter words, his expression changed as Ali bin Hashim's avarice drained away and he was his old self once again. Here, mother, please. Executioner, he can have the morning off. You say this next tale is special. It is, to me. Why? Because it has another one of your messages? Messages, husband. Oh, don't think I can't see what you're doing with these tales. Ali Baba and his, and his servant Murjana trust women. The king's jester, don't let your actions be driven by fear. The dream, people can change. Abu Hassan and his historic gust of wind, some things are best forgotten. And you think I need to be taught all these things, do you? Well, you can speak. I'm not a tyrant. Well, of course I am. But you can speak your mind anyway. I think all of us have things to learn from stories, husband. The king as much as the beggar. How commendably democratic. So what's the message behind this next one? I can't be sure until I tell it, but I think it will show us that we should never know what life has in store. That's true enough. Where does it start? In China. China. Or anywhere, really. The place doesn't matter. You are the strangest storyteller. I do my best to keep you bewildered, husband. 
<laughs> and I think there's a part for you in this story. All right, tell it. The, the tale of Aladdin and his wonderful lamp. In the capital of a vast kingdom that might have been China. But might equally have been somewhere completely different. There lived a poor widow and her disreputable son. Disreputable? He was lazy and irresponsible. He idled his days away, mixing with the worst of people. His mother despaired of him. <laughs> you can get yourself a job. I'm not having you sponging off me for the rest of your life. You're harshing my mellow, man. I have a job. Wiping tavern tables does not constitute a job. At your age, your father had a business. A tailor. <laughs> yes, a tailor. Any problems with that? I want a light, dude. <laughs> you want to sit on your skinny butt doing zippo. That's what you want. And you sign of work and you run for the hills. <coughs> you need to get up the energy to run, that is. Oh, and <coughs> typical. Absolutely cast iron. Typical. All right, get out and stay out. And don't come back until you have some money in your pocket. Something to do with your father. Look if he was loaded by any chance. Judge for yourself. Here he is. It can't be, but it is. The same eyes, the same nose, the same noble bearing. Same as your dear father, of course. It is son of Mustafa the tailor, right? Yeah. Oh, my dear nephew, how long have I searched for you? You're my uncle. Oh, yes. You wouldn't have met me, and your dear mother will not recognize me, for I have spent most of my adult years in the Makhlin. The where? North Africa, where I've learned much. And before he had time to make an excuse, of course, as his mother would say, for the king, Aladdin found he had not only taken the man home, but had invited him to supper. The where? The Makhlin. North Africa, where I've learned much, and amassed something of a fortune. <laughs> Did you say a fortune? Yes, yes. <laughs> Gold, diamonds, camels, that sort of thing. And having no heir, I was hoping to share my wealth with my dear nephew and dear sister-in-law. If, of course, that is acceptable to you both. <laughs> so, promising to take Aladdin into a distant land where part of his fortune was stashed, the old man set out the following day with the younger man in tow, enthralling him with tales of his exploits and the riches he had amassed. But first, we will set you up as a merchant, nephew. That is a fitting profession for a young man with the expectations such as yours. That is totally cool, Grace. So what do you fancy in trading in? Spices, fabrics, wine? Wine, no question. Wine it shall be, then. We seem to have left the city, that right? Yes, yes, that's right. So there are banks out here? Oh, bank, did I say bank? Oh, no. I require much greater secrecy than any bank can afford. So where? You will see in time, nephew. Be patient. Be patient. And night was falling before they arrived at a deserted place in a narrow pass between two mountains. And if things had so far seemed a bit odd, it was here that they were to become odder still. That's it. Over here. Over here. Now, stand here and don't move. Hollywood <laughs> <Parlez> Francais! <laughs> this is way spooky, man. I want to go home. <clears throat> Dude! You disobeyed me. I said don't move. <clears throat> now. Just do as I say, and you will soon be the richest man in all of the kingdom. Understand me? Good. See this stone slab? All you have to do is move it from one side to the other. Man, that looks heavy. I'm... You can do it, my boy. Go on. Ton, can you give me a hand? No, only you can do it. Just say your names and the names of your mother and father as you take hold of it. Are you serious? Yes, yes, um, here. 
Take this ring. It will protect you from harm. Rad? Wait, wait, wait. Harm? <coughs> the family names, remember. I am Aladdin, son of Mustafa the tailor, and his wife, Hafida. I am Aladdin, son of. Yo! I said the names, and it's like. Yes, 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 yes. Now, here, shine your lantern, and you will see some steps. Oh, yeah. Sweet. Climb down them, and when you're at the bottom, I will tell you what to look for. I'm not sure I want to do. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, this way. I'll just climb to the hole. <laughs> Cowabunga! What do you see? Wonderful things, dude! Jewels and silver plates? Oh, trash, trash, trash! You can ignore all that. Just do as I say. Just do as I say. It has a powerful spell laid upon it. Touch it and you will die in an instant. Uh, she was lying, of course. Understand me? Now, there should be a doorway ahead of you. Do you see it? I think so. Good. Go through. But it isn't. Look for an alcove near the bottom of the wall. What do you see? Just a pile of old rags. Ha! Ah, but under the rags? Come oh, on, man. It's just an old lamp. Oh, bring it to me now! It's all dusty and tarnished and stuff. No, 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 no. Don't rub it. Just put it in your sack and bring it back to me. All right. So I don't see why. Just hurry, hurry! But back in the main underground cavern, Aladdin refused to hurry. Mesmerized as he was by the treasures on either side of him. Chests of jewels like glowing fruits, and plates as lustrous as the suns in the east. I am seriously so. And soon his sack was full of treasure and so heavy that he could barely lift it. So that's as he arrived at the foot of the stairs, and the sorcerer demanded. Now, hand me up the lamp. He was obliged to reply. Uh, bitch, you. It's at the bottom of the sack. What? What? Other stuff. You stupid child! Oh. Look, just hand me up the lamp. I can't do that. Why not? Look, just empty out the trash and hand me up the lamp. The sorcerer becoming more and more furious. Aladdin more and more determined. Until finally, he was <laughs> by the boy's stubbornness. And deciding that the best plan was simply to replace the slab, forget about the lamp, and starve Aladdin to death. The sorcerer uttered another incantation. Brecken sie Deutsch! That should have been the end of Aladdin. But the man who believed he had destroyed him had unwittingly given him the means to lie. Two days passed. Aladdin now faint from want of food. His mouth parched from lack of water. When, for the first time since childhood, fearing lest he should be slipping into the shadows of death, Aladdin decided to pray. And as he cleaned his hand, he inadvertently rubbed the ring which the sorcerer had given him. Will. 
mortals. They prospered. The mother happy because she could eat well and dress finely. Aladdin happy because he didn't have to get a job. And they thrived in this blessed condition until one day when Aladdin was leaving the tavern. Where he was now a most welcome customer. He heard an excited murmur coming from the direction of the marketplace. Murmur, murmur, Where a crowd had gathered around the town crier. Wait a minute. Wait a minute! Who are you? Enter crowd murmuring in excitement. Diversifying in response to a volatile advertising market, we have joined the acting profession. Forty extras, limited, specializing in adding local color, background murmuring, and milling about. That's us. All right, Dara. Do what you're best at. <laughs> hear ye, hear ye. Let it be understood that the Princess Badger Abudor, Moon of Moons, will visit the Royal Bathhouse within one minute of the end of this announcement. Shops are to be closed, houses shut up, streets evacuated, for no man or woman or woman will be permitted to gaze upon the princess's ineffable loveliness. Ineffable? Look it up! Now the rest of you, disperse! Is this good? 
gift not worthy of my daughter, and should I not give her to whomever values her at such a price? <laughs> <laughs> Woman, go to your son. Tell him I accept his dowry. My daughter shall be his bride. The wedding will be this very night. Bet. <laughs> A good ending, though... Yes, husband? It does not seem quite right that the princess, whom I should like to point out, has never even met this Aladdin But surely fellow. that is unimportant. The marriage contract is between the parents. Yes. Yes, though I... You have a further reservation? Well, this Aladdin fellow is hardly every young woman's ideal mate. She has no say, husband. <laughs> no. No, no, of course not, but... What if the story were not yet ended? Well, I thought it was. No, there's just a little more. And perhaps you would be so good as to aid me in telling it? Yeah, I will, if you're confident that, oh, Given God. Given that you believe this other thing must be unworthy of the princess, hey. then why not create a husband for her who is, if you think you can play the part, that is? I will try. This is going to be so awful, dude. I think it will be awesome. Yes, sir. One more thing. Oh, good luck. Thank you. No sweat, bro. <laughs> My princess, Mother of the Moon of Moon. I'm glad you asked. Long believing Aladdin to have died in the cave and the magic land to be lost young man who had come into unspeakable wealth and married the king's daughter. Aladdin, It must be! And he clearly has the lips! Wasting no time, he left his home and traveled for many months before arriving at the city where lived Aladdin and the princess Badra al -Fadur. And disguising himself as an old peddler, he walked the streets offering... Offering what, sister? New lamp rolls! New lamp rolls! Now, lamp among the sorcerers, many... Among the genie of the lamps, Gifts, the genie had conjured up the finest palace known to humanity, and it was here the blissful couple lived. It was to this palace also that the sorcerer made his way, for he now knew where the magic lamp must be hidden. And was trusting that somewhere within the palace walls there would be someone foolish enough to hand it over. New lamp fro, 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 new lamp fro. Here, wait! And so it came to pass. Who could have foretold after all these years it would be so easy? I am the servant of the lamp. Oh, uh, actually, you you know who I am. Yes, <laughs> but I want to hear you say it. I am the servant of the lamp. Go on. Your will is my command. And you will never forget it. Now this palace that you have created, with its crystal fountains, its pearl and crescent walls, its gardens to surpass Babylon. You want me to destroy it? Oh, no, no, no. I simply wish for you to move it. <laughs> move it? Move it where? The Mothman. Where's North Africa, you moron. There's nobody who own an atlas. Just take it there. And everybody in it. When Aladdin returned home, he found a hole in the ground. Bro! Alice and his beloved princess. Stop playing him. <laughs> Baby girl! <laughs> I am the oh dear, you don't look so good. The sorcerer has abducted the princess and stolen the palace. Get it back. I implore you. I could, but I am merely the servant of the ring, you know. You must ask the servant of the lamp, the big one. What I could do is take it there. Where? We're out of the palace in now. I know who's responsible for it, and you have taken it to the mother. Where's the... Never mind that. Just set me down under my dear wife's window, and we'll sort out the geography later. So the genie did as he promised, pinpointing the Mahra through whatever location finding system genies had in those days, and placing Aladdin directly below the captured princess's window. <laughs> <laughs> Aladdin! 
Princess! Husband, I knew you would come. Now, now what, what we, we must, must do is... is... You have a plan? No. I didn't think you would. Here's what we do. And the princess sent a note to the sorcerer. Who had been wooing her, for he wanted to make her his wife. Inviting him over for supper that evening, for, as she said, I'm now resigned to never see my home again. I need a strong man to protect me. Oh, my dear. Oh, in my country, it is custom for couples who pledged each other's mutual love to drink each other's health by exchanging cups. I drink from yours, you from mine. What a charming observance. And now, my dear, my, 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 <laughs> my, my, my. For the cup contained a powerful drug obtained by the genie of the ring and cunningly and riskily placed by the plucky princess in her own drink. The sorcerer was stripped of his magic and sent back to the mother. The where? where? Google it. <laughs> and the teeny genie of the ring. All the genie and the princess ruled justly and wisely for many, many years. So, husband, on your patience evermore attending, new joy wait on you. Here my tales have ending. Ending? I have told you tales for a thousand and one nights, husband. Yes, wonderful tales. To keep myself alive. I can tell no more stories under these conditions. Oh, Shahrazad, I thought I had learned so much from you. But I have failed to learn the simplest thing. How to let you know that I could <coughs> never live without you. You have transformed me <coughs> with your courage, your stories, and my faith in you. Mm -hmm.